It was a watershed moment, no doubt about it. Eight years ago last month, Hillbilly Junction in Willow Springs, Missouri, closed its doors for the final time. I, I'm sure everybody knew that. <laughs> It went to its eternal slumber quietly and without fanfare, befitting the dignity of the venerable convenience store slash restaurant slash gas station slash preeminent purveyor of corncob pipes, hillbilly postcards, and Ma and Paul salt and pepper shakers. The closing marked the end for a store that had been a staple for generations of travelers in South Central Missouri. It's the place where I bought my last Missouri Meerschaum, my last outhouse calendar. <laughs> And that's a calendar of pictures of outhouses <laughs> that you can also put in your outhouse. But the closing may have flashed a signal of greater cultural and historical import. It may have marked the end of the hillbilly's reign as chief symbol of the Ozarks. In fact, the demise of Hillbilly Junction may have signaled a fundamental departure from the way race and image have co-mingled in the hill country for more than a century. But first, let us revisit the birth of a regional construct. Way back in the 1990s, at some point between a segment on CBS's 60 Minutes and a Bart Simpson road trip on Fox, the town of Branson wiggled its way into the national consciousness as an evangelical middle American hillbilly Vegas. But generations before Nelson Muntz's teary-eyed plea for an Andy Williams encore at the Moon River Theater, Andy wouldn't have called it theater, but I call it theater. <laughs> Branson was already among the Midwest's most popular tourist destinations. In the days before live music shows, go-kart tracks, and economy steakhouses, the line the strip between Branson and Silver Dollar City, it was a book that beckoned travelers to the White River country. Harold Bell Wright's formulaic melodrama, The Shepherd of the Hills, became one of the best-selling novels of the early 20th century. I miss, I miss Nelson. Yeah. All right. There we go. Make sure I don't need the next picture. Yeah, let's see. Yeah, we'll leave that up there for a while. <laughs> it inspired no fewer than three Hollywood film versions before Pearl Harbor and sparked a tourism boom that found people scouring the hills and hollers for the real life inspirations for the book's characters. So powerful was the novel's effect that the Branson region became known as the Shepherd of the Hills Country. But something sinister lurks behind the romantic God's Country facade of this foundation of Branson tourism. If I told you that sinister something was rooted in racism, you probably wouldn't bat an eye. After all, just one year before the publication of The Shepherd of the Hills, a devilish mob of whites just up the road in Springfield lynched three young black men on the city square capping off a dozen years of sporadic, racially motivated violence in southwestern Missouri. But it's more complex than that. Harold Bell Wright's most famous novel was no celebration of Judge Lynch, no matter the color of the victim. The specific strain of prejudice we're talking about here is that orgy of blue blood racism we call the eugenics movement. Almost certainly influenced by the broad currents of that movement, Wright went to great lengths to trace the genetic and cultural family trees of the novel's heroes and heroines to locales safely removed from the Highland South. Most of his real natives of the Ozarks remain peripheral and undeveloped characters, or morally or physically deficient. Though commonly portrayed as a celebration of rural Ozarks culture and values, the Shepherd of the Hills bears no love for real Ozarkers. The early 20th century rhetoric of eugenics is inextricably linked 
to both the creation of an Ozarks regional construct and rising interest in Ozarkers, from the fiction of the local colorist and the clarion calls of mountain missionaries to the pseudo-anthropological treatises of Ozarks observers, this racialized and racist rhetoric pervaded the nation's dialogue concerning the region and its allegedly pure Anglo-Saxon inhabitants. This rhetoric even changed in tone over time, reflecting a gradual alteration in the way eugenicists and other race-conscious observers conceptualized the Highland South. The rural dwellers of the hill country whom the outsiders considered the true Ozarkers were at first dismissed as the irredeemable and isolated declensions of a noble race, only to later be exalted as the treasured bearers of Anglo-Saxon folk culture, all but lost beyond the isolating highlands of the U.S. South. Many old guard Yankees of Protestant Northern European descent eventually came around to the latter view. When this new version of hill people heritage gained the upper hand, calls for cultural celebration and preservation superseded the dismissive othering of Wright and his fellow novelists. Regionalist or local color fiction filled the pages of popular magazines in the post-Reconstruction years and found its way into novels and plays. Regionalist fiction required little more than, quote, a zone of backwardness where locally variant folkways still prevail, according to literary scholar Richard H. Broadhead. Appalachia emerged as a popular setting for such stories early on, and Appalachian local color hit its stride in the 1880s and 90s, painting romantic yet backward portraits of isolated mountaineers and the outsiders who encountered them. But it was The Shepherd of the Hills, published in 1907, that fully introduced the spirit of eugenics into regionalist literature set in the Ozarks. Whether inspired by his fascination with the muscular Christianity movement, which responded to the same foreign threats to the collective Anglo-Saxon Protestant psyche, or by his familiarity with eugenics writings, The Shepherd of the Hills reflected Wright's preoccupation with physical vitality and family bloodlines. In the story, Chicago minister Daniel Howitt retreats to the back country to regain his health. There he is welcomed by the kindly noble Matthews family, and in turn Howitt takes under his wing a vivacious young woman, Sammy Lane. For Harold Bell Wright, the Ozark uplift contained within its hills the elixir of rejuvenation, but the potion apparently required a worthy host on which to work its magic. It seems to have had no effect on the real mountaineers, the real natives of the Ozarks. If anything, the isolation and serenity craved by the educated and affluent of the cities bred only ignorance and backwardness in most Ozarkers. Wright sets the tone in the opening pages when Howitt first encounters a true youngster of the hills, Jed Holland. From the stranger's tailored clothing and well-groomed hair to his marvelously pure, deep, and musical voice, Jed sensed something different about Howitt. Quote, the boy looked at the speaker in wide-eyed wonder. He had a queer feeling that he was in the presence of a superior being. Like Jed, the novel's other natives are minor characters with two notable exceptions. Ollie Stewart, whose physical degeneration after leaving the hills for the city reinforces Wright's anti-urban theme, and Wash Gibbs, a hulking, brutish mountain man and leader of the local band of vigilantes. If you're familiar with the story, you might ask, but what about the Lanes, the Matthewses, the two families who come closest to embodying the pure Christian ideals of God's country? Wright goes out of his way to establish the non-Ozarks bloodlines of the families that produced the nubile youngsters who, quote, owed it to the race to marry and procreate. Jim Lane, Sammy's father, is identified as the product of, quote, good breeding. This scion of a distinguished old family of the Deep South married a mountain maiden, and like mating a Hereford bull to a scrub heifer, significantly improved Sammy's bloodline, producing a young woman, quote, deep bosomed with limbs full rounded, fairly tingling with the life and strength of perfect womanhood. The Matthews, as it turns out, found their way to the Ozarks, not from the hills of Tennessee or Kentucky, but from Illinois, a migration pattern that Wright employs to reinforce their Yankee descent, an even stronger link with the heralded Anglo-Saxon heritage. Don't never be afraid to bank on old blood, Wright has one of his characters proclaimed. 
it'll see you through. In his universe, the superior bloodlines of the Matthewses and Lames render them amenable to the cultivation of the learned and altruistic outsider, the only method by which the salvation of the Ozarks is possible. Wright held no affinity for those he would have considered the true hill people of the Ozarks. The natives were interesting in a quaint way with their superstitions and hellfire religion and Saturday night shindigs, and they could be rendered useful with the right kind of cultivation by knowledgeable and caring outsiders. But in the final estimation, they were superfluous to the central function of the Ozarks in the world of the local colorists and their readers, region as refuge from the ills and anxieties of modern urban life. Only those with the money, education, and breeding to appreciate the restorative spiritual qualities of the Ozarks could claim its benefits and in turn extol its virtues to its ignorant rural natives. Wright's transparent yet easy to overlook racial messages reflected the state of eugenics thought at the time. In a world where whiteness was normative, people from outside the so-called Nordic race weren't the primary concern. Eugenicists assumed that those people's innate inferiority would take care of that part of the race problem, the survival of the fittest. What most concerned the eugenicists were the mudsills of their own race, the poor, ignorant whites who threatened to spoil the whole bunch. Some people, such people bred in profusion in places like the Ozarks, and most of the eugenics-inspired laws passed in the early 20th century targeted poor whites above all other groups, especially poor white women. In the decade following the publication of The Shepherd of the Hills, publishers issued at least 10 novels set in the Ozarks. Those that fell into the local color genre followed a rather narrow, conventional outline involving a protagonist from outside the region who moves into the Ozarks and overcomes a variety of obstacles to achieve some sort of noble goal or win the hand of a beautiful mate and sometimes both. As in Wright's fictional Ozarks, most true Ozarkers, these novel, most true Ozarkers in these novels remain nothing but peripheral characters, devoid of agency and only rarely worthy of the philanthropy and knowledge imparted by outsiders. With their bold anti-urbanism, their eugenics-laced character descriptions, and their preference for outsider characters over true natives, Howard Leslie Terry's A Voice from the Silence from 1914 and Caroline Abbott Stanley's The Keeper of the Vineyard from 1913 best illustrate the Ozarks novels inspired by The Shepherd of the Hills. In A Voice from the Silence, the Andersons flee St. Louis for the rural Ozarks where they befriend the nearby Harlows, well-bred newcomers from Illinois, and take in a local orphan teenager after her grandparents die in a blizzard. The orphan, May, is the only true native central to the story in a voice from the silence. Her exceptionalism explained as, quote, one of those remarkable instances of intelligence and precocity sometimes found springing from obscure stock in the wilderness. Quote, there was a marked absence of coarseness about her that is almost always found in the lowly born, however beautiful otherwise. A miracle lost on her backwoods grandparents who could never appreciate what a gracious providence had given them. May is, quote, drawn into a sphere of culture and develops into a useful person or even a benefactor to the race. Ultimately, the salvation of the Ozarks depends upon newcomers like the Andersons and Harlows who take a paternal interest in their native neighbors despite their, quote, quaint ways and lack of breeding. Only outsiders possess the superior breeding and training required for success in the modern world. The birth of the Andersons' child, quote, a picture for the eugenist, its blue eyes gazing on a mysterious world, this heaven-sent bit of humanity, instills confidence in a bright future for the Ozarks, if not for the mass of Ozarkers. Caroline Abbott Stanley's The Keeper of the Vineyard offers a similar tale of back to the land redemption and reclamation, but through a woman's perspective. Saddled with the care of her orphan nieces and nephews, Nell Dinwoody, a 30-something unmarried school marm in Chicago, retreats to a 40-acre plot of land in remote northwestern or southwestern Missouri. Dinwoody takes charge of the local school and initially plans to entertain friends back in Chicago with 
letters describing the ugly ignorance of her backwoods neighbors. But a visit to the forlorn log cabin of the impoverished Moonies, a 30-something couple with 11 children and five grandchildren, kindles within Dinwoody the missionary spirit. Quote, she had felt impatient scorn of all this yesterday and of them, writes Stanley of the teacher's encounter with true Ozarkers. But today, somehow, as she looked at these same people, that impatience softened to pity, how much they missed out of life, they who had never been taught to see. Stanley produced the era's most eugenics-infused Ozarks novel. Per convention, her allies and community uplift, reclusive but handsome Burton Gilmer and his strapping nephew Neil, turn out to be the possessors of distinguished non-native breeding, rendering them suitable marriage partners for Dinwoody and her niece. Though Neil had known no life outside of the hill country, he possessed an instinctive understanding that the local girls, quote, were not of his kind. Naturally, for the young women of their kind, he felt no attraction. They were not of his species. Upon first meeting a talented and articulate minister, Dinwoody is convinced that, quote, he is not a native product, only to be stunned when she later discovers that he is, in fact, a local. This surprising development reveals a more redemptive strain of eugenics thought, if only by a little bit. Whereas Wright and other local colorists generally dismissed the natives while claiming the restorative properties of the Ozarks for sojourning outsiders, Stanley employed the imagery of the arrested frontier to capture a sliver of promise for real Ozarkers. Quote, we have plenty of good material in this country, one character assures Dinwoody. It is a native-born population largely. We haven't the race problem of the South nor the immigration problem of the North. These people of the hills are simply belated. They have fallen behind the procession and it's hard to catch up, but we can help those who have fallen behind. It's a little shift. The tonal change reflected in the Keeper of the Vineyard coincided with a broader movement toward reclaiming the white degenerates of poor places like the Ozarks. According to sociologist Matt Ray, it was the Rockefeller Sanitary Commission's hookworm eradication campaign of 1909 through 1915 that partially rebranded poor white trash as pure white Americans, at least for some observers. Physical disease began to supplant genealogical aberration as the primary explanation for the declension of an entire segment of the white race. It opened the door, says Ray, for eugenicists to concentrate on saving rural Ozarkers and other debased whites instead of condemning them. Whatever the reason, by the end of the Keeper of the Vineyard, the cultural and moral uplift of a redeemable race, or at least their children, becomes the mission. Nell Dinwoody sets out to save the natives by mentoring the one Mooney daughter displaying a spark of intelligence and ambition. This more heroic eugenics message only began to appear in depictions of the Ozarks more than a decade into the new century. The earliest nonfiction examples came from the pens of those writing about missionary educators. In 1916, American Magazine ran a feature story on Illinois native G. Byron Smith, founder of Iberia Academy in Miller County. Smith informed author Bruce Barton that, quote, right here in these mountain counties are the purest blooded Americans in America. You never saw more splendid people. Rub your hand across them only half a dozen times and you are astounded at the ease with which they take on polish. In Smith and Barton's estimation, it still took an able outsider to rescue this last remnant of Anglo-Saxon purity. Quote, I wish that you could drive out into the hills for a hundred miles or so in either direction, Smith claimed. There are 2,000 rude mountain homes around here where there was no vision and so the people perish. We've taken a boy or girl out of each one of these homes. I wish you could have seen them before and after. The hill folks now embodied a potential and hopefulness that they had not possessed in the Shepherd of the Hills. By the 1920s, there was little trace of the more negative and narrow eugenics interpretation of the Ozarks found in the work of Wright and most of those local colorists. When noted eugenicist Arthur H. Estabrook's 1929 magazine article on the Ozarks, listed the genetic constitution of the population, along with poor soil and depletion of natural resources as the causes of the region's poverty, his pessimism was no longer in fashion. In 
riding the crest of the positive eugenics wave, journalists, travel writers, and folklorists celebrated the supposed racial purity of allegedly isolated Ozarkers. In 1927, photojournalist and Illinois native Charles Phelps Cushing assured readers of The Mentor that off the well-traveled roads lived, quote, a splendid stock of sturdy American humanity, rare and racy of the soil, last survivors of a hardy race of mountaineers. So pure were the British bloodlines, suggested Cushing, that even if the reader, quote, thought of yourself as a genuine 100 percenter, the Mountaineers, with excellent justification, regard you as a foreigner in their United States. In the outlook, New Yorker Lawrence F. Abbott chronicled the heroic efforts of students at Arkansas's College of the Ozarks, whose families, quote, were a pure Anglo-Saxon strain. Abbott praised the Ozarks for producing, quote, representatives of fine old American stock whose physique, crania, and profiles would not have been out of place among the Greek athletes in the stadium at Athens. By the late 20s, the little school that Abbott, that Abbott championed had perfected the art of leveraging its students' alleged racial purity into donations from anxious, wealthy Protestants in New York City. One year after Abbott visited the College of the Ozarks, Elmer J. Boer, a Northern Presbyterian missionary, cut to the chase in an interview with a Kansas City reporter. America's greatest problem today is in the flood of immigration from the lower levels of European society that is threatening to submerge and destroy our American ideals. Sociologists tell us there remain in America only two great seedbeds of Anglo-Saxon intellect, and they are in the Southern Appalachians and in the Ozarks. Right here in these Ozark Hills is a greater wealth of native Anglo-Saxon intelligence than in any other section of the United States. In my parish are 2,000 descendants of the pure, clean-bred, sturdy stock that settled America and founded our government, the same stock that produced such men as Jackson and Lincoln. The Ozark Mountaineer is America's best bet today. These are the people we are working to save and to keep. Boer's school and mission post in the rural hamlet of Kingston, Arkansas, had its own in-house publicity machine in Otto E. Rayburn, a Kansas-raised teacher and magazine publisher. More than anyone else in the Ozarks, Rayburn indulged the myth of Anglo-Saxonism, later devoting an entire chapter to the subject in his popular and romantic 1941 book, Ozark Country. But Rayburn's celebration of Anglo-Saxonism marked the last hurrah for such pronouncements. Already in state decline by the end of the Depression, the movement all but disappeared in the wake of Nazi atrocities linked to some of the very same racial theories that had fueled eugenics thought. The eugenics movement receded into the dark corners of society, but interest in the Ozarks and in its supposedly isolated residents ramped up. Magazines peddled both the physical beauty of the hill country and the alleged independent pioneer spirit of the hill people, almost all of whom were in fact white by this time. Post-World War II attention to the Ozarks may have lacked the overt racial and racist underpinning of the pre-war era, but an implicit whiteness still anchored the enterprise. Journalists, scholars, and popularizers mined and preserved what were presumed to be old-world British relics in a remote land of pure-blooded settlers in the atomic age, ballads and fiddle music, jack tales, Shakespearean words and phrases. In American popular culture, the Ozarks maintained an uneasy and suspect relevance through hillbilly characters created by outsiders. Like all hillbilly imagery, notes historian Anthony Harkins in his book Hillbilly, A Cultural History of an American Icon, these characters carry dual meanings. Like Harold Bell writes, real Ozarkers, they could be primitive, destructive, and unworthy. More often, they reflected the positive traits of the post-eugenics portraits, resourcefulness, genuineness, and independence, all attributes sure to appeal to wannabe pioneers in an age of TV westerns and folk festivals. This duality, writes Harkins, was inextricably linked to the hillbilly's white racial status. Middle-class white Americans, observes Harkins, could see these people as a fascinating and exotic other, akin to Native Americans or blacks, while at the same time sympathized with them as poorer and less modern versions of themselves. <laughs> 
The mixture of admiration and pity was an intoxicating brew for suburbanites drifting along glistening new highways and V8 land barges. It was the pinnacle of the hillbilly, the era that gave us Silver Dollar City and Dog Patch USA, the Arkansas Traveler Folk Theater in Dog Patch Village at the Lake of the Ozarks, the Beverly Hillbillies in Petticoat Junction, Davis Baskets, Ozark Land, and so many other roadside traps peddling corncob pipes and felt hats that we can't even count them today. When I began formally studying the Ozarks 30 years ago, the hillbilly was still at the heart of the enterprise. You had to reckon with that caricature. Image was central to any study of the region, and the whiteness of that image was implicit. To non-whites, it was probably as explicit as a neon sign on the strip in Branson. And the Ozarks was one of the nation's widest places. In the core counties of the Ozarks in 1990, 19 of every 20 people were non-Hispanic whites. If you remove the counties of the Oklahoma Ozarks, where Native Americans made up roughly one-third of the population, the wide non-Hispanic percentage of the population rose to 96.7%. Of the 42 Missouri counties in the core Ozarks, 10 had populations that were less than 2% non-white or Hispanic in 1990. And only one, Pulaski County, home of the Army's Fort Leonard Wood, had a white non-Hispanic population less than 95%. But the signs of change were there, if barely so. The poultry processors of northwestern Arkansas and southwestern Missouri were welcoming the vanguard of a great army of Hispanic workers. Walmart was just beginning to abandon its more jingoistic than pro-labor Buy American campaign and position itself as a major international force in retail. In the last three decades, the Ozark region has undergone demographic shifts unseen since the early 19th century, an era in which the Osages vied for space and power with both Anglo-American settlers and immigrant American Indians from east of the Mississippi. Though we still await final numbers from the census of 2020, it is clear that the modern Ozarks, while still much wider than the nation as a whole, is much less wide than three decades ago. The 2020 census will reflect a region in which at least five core Ozark counties report non-white and Hispanic populations in excess of 20%. Benton County, Arkansas, headquarters of Walmart, is both the region's most racially diverse county and its most affluent. In 1990, 96.6% .6 of Benton's population was composed of non-Hispanic whites. Today, that group accounts for barely two-thirds the population. And the numbers almost certainly will continue to trend in that direction. In two of northwestern Arkansas's largest school districts, white students are in the minority. And several other districts in Arkansas and southwestern Missouri have student bodies that are more than 40% non-white and Hispanic. The impact of demographic change has been greatest in areas with major poultry processors, but the entire Ozark region reflects the nation's increase in non-white and Hispanic populations. Even if we adjust for the tremendous increase in race-shifting whites, the number of Ozarkers identifying as non-white has risen decidedly, even in rural, remote counties. The region will continue to become more racially and ethnically diverse, reflecting a reality shaping modern America. As this happens, what becomes of the hillbilly? The shuttering of Hillbilly Junction eight years ago was just one of many signals that the 21st century Ozarks is a different animal than the 20th century Ozarks. Barely more than a year before Hillbilly Junction's closure, the magazine of anachronism called the Ozarks Mountaineer published its final issue after a 60 year run. Davis Baskets on US 54 between Camdenton and Max Creek closed for good in the summer of 2020. At the pinnacle of Branson's regional music city phase 40 years ago, a dozen hillbilly theaters dotted the Highway 76 strip. Today, only one remains. Even the ubiquitous Ozark Land stores carry almost no merchandise betraying their roots in tacky hillbilly jujaws and doodads. The Ozark hillbilly, it seems, has no place in the 21st century. And the issue of race is at the heart of it. 
The hillbilly, like his cousins, the redneck, the cracker, and poor white trash, is a manifestation of a time and place in which whiteness was normative. The hillbilly was a creation of mainstream white society. It was middle class and affluent whites who othered poor rural Ozarkers and their Appalachian kin into a subset of the race, the not quite white. The hillbilly thus became an object, for some an object of envy. What suburbanite didn't secretly desire his presumed carefree double double middle finger to the man sexually promiscuous survived by your wits lifestyle. By the same token, he became an object of scorn, proof of the lie of Nordic racial superiority, burden on social services, scourge of good taste and comportment wherever the winds blew him. But in a nation on a rapid march toward a not so distant future when whites will find themselves a minority of the population, in a nation that prioritizes racial and ethnic di distinctions over class divisions, we may finally have reached a time that no longer needs or wants white exotics. At the least, white exotics do not reside in the symbolic space they occupied just a generation ago. Regardless of your opinion on the accuracy and utility of a concept like white privilege or the seeming dissonance of its application to the pockets of persistent poverty and wide swaths of the rural Ozarks, the toxicity of whiteness in our current cultural climate has undoubtedly made the hillbilly a less appealing regional symbol. Not for the people who've been saddled with the hillbilly label, where there's no evidence that they've been welcomed beneath the shield of political correctness, but for those with no direct connection to hillbillies, real or otherwise, the hillbilly has little appeal. Take, for instance, the aforementioned race shifters. In this case, whites claiming, often without any evidence, membership in or connection to some other racial category. Just within the Ozarks, race shifting appears to be the most likely explanation for an explosion in the American Indian population since 2000 the year the Census Bureau began allowing respondents to claim more than one race. Members of federally recognized indigenous nations have labeled such race shifters pretendians. <laughs> Scholars who study this recent phenomenon find that toxic whiteness with its historical allusions to colonial genocide and systemic racism is one of the primary motivators for race shifting among people we would otherwise label white. Another is the simple desire to claim multicultural status in a society that celebrates it. Beyond pretendians and other race shifters, there is another group for whom the hillbilly has little to no appeal, non-whites. The caricature may offer some utility as a member of the white race who is nonetheless an object of ridicule, but in an increasingly diverse nation, the days of whiteness as the default setting are numbered, if not plumb kaput, Non-whites are exercising demographic muscles in unprecedented ways, weighing in, on, weighing in on what stays and what goes in the nation's house cleaning, cultural, political, and otherwise. The room occupied by the Ozarks is not exempt from that cleaning, just as the Ozarkers were never isolated and separated from the currents of American history. The hillbilly, the very regional construct of the Ozarks was a product of a white normative era, an age in which eugenicists feared that a batch of unworthy poor whites endangered the master race while simultaneously recognizing their potential as bulwarks against an onslaught of Europe's rabble and refuse. That hillbilly will likely not survive in the 21st century because the normative race is no longer the normative race. Like Hillbilly Junction, the hillbilly will drift into memory as a symbol of the 20th century Ozarks. He beckons from a specific time and place and a nation moving on from that time and place. So hail hillbilly and so long. In the Ozarks, we hardly knew anything but you. You can come on back and sit a spell, but keep your shoes on and leave the hound and the shotgun on the front porch. Thank you.